You're listening to the Silicon Valley Podcast. All right, while everyone's sitting getting adjusted, how about let's just go down the panel. Dan, would you like to go first? Just give a brief 30 second introduction of yourself, your background, what you're working on, just a little bit of who you are to the audience. Okay. Um, Jane Buell, we, uh, I founded a company, an independent RIA, more than 20 years ago. We are uh, fiduciary financial advisors headquartered in Redwood City. Um, and we work largely with executives, professionals, and business owners. So would love to meet you all here. Cool. Uh, my name is Tyler Martin. First, uh, thanks everyone for being here. We, re we really appreciate it. Um, I am a CFO. I work with small business clients, typically about one to 15 million in annual revenue. Uh, I've been blessed in my life to exit a couple small businesses. And so I typically help businesses get to that stage of being able to exit, and grow, and be highly profitable. That's a little bit about me. Hi, my name is Sherry Pan. I'm a CEO and founder of Pantheon Wealth Planning. We specialize in financial planning for, for small business owners, close to the hill, and some of the retirees. Um, I've been in the industry over 20 years. In addition to the certified financial planning, I also have a master in taxation degree. So I help a lot of clients to minimize their taxes and work closely with a CPA. So I'm very happy to be here and I hope to meet many of you today. Thank you. And I'm Anna Voronsova, Valuation Services at Anderson. Uh, we help our corporate clients as well as individuals in performing valuation of their business, business interests, uh, assets, including real estate and intangible assets. Our corporate clients uh, range from a few million to a multi-billion dollar businesses um, and span across pretty much all the industries. Um, and we also serve the uh, individuals uh, and primarily high net worth individuals. The purposes of valuation is financial uh, planning and reporting, a gift and estate, tax planning and reporting, uh, litigation, and so on. Thank you for being here, and, and I'm grateful to be here as well. All right. Now, first question. Okay. Hey. <laughs> first question for the panel. Say I wanted to sell my business. How long do I need to prepare? Maybe a weekend, maybe a week. <laughs> How long is needed? And you know, when would when would be optimal for them to start talking to you? Dane, do you want to go? Or Tyler? As I'll tell you, I mean, from my perspective, as long as you have, I mean, if you're thinking about doing this, give yourself some time. I mean, I, a long time ago, I, I somebody said to me, if you're doing if you're working on a project, there are three things that you can choose. Um, good, fast, and cheap. You get two, right? So you're always going to give something up. And in this kind of a project, good is what you want. Um, fast is really flexibility. You've got, you've got either a lot of flexibility or not. And cheap is, frankly, probably tax efficiency, right? So if you want something that is really good and really tax efficient, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take time to do. And the longer you give yourself, the better off you are. And I can say a lot more about that, but I want to let my colleagues say something too. Yeah, I'd, I'd say there's two ways of looking at it. Um, do it from day one of when you start a business would be ideal. So literally like setting up processes, delegation, all those things that small businesses typically don't do. I'd say that'd be ideal. Having said that, most businesses don't do that. So I'd say three years is a good window. Um, it gives you time to have nice financial trending. It gives you time to make a good consistent story. Um, so, so three years would be ideal. Now, as a practical matter, most businesses, it's usually a year or sometimes even less than that. Unfortunately, maybe even a weekend if there's a health concern. Um, the problem if you do that is you're sacrificing value. Um, you're not able to tell the same story. Uh, you probably aren't prepared. You don't have your team key people like wealth management people, tax people, uh, valuation people, and it's just costing you dollars. So the sooner you can do it, lay that foundation of, and infrastructure, the better the result you're going to do, the better return you're going to get. And then the most important part is know where you, what, what life after the sale is going to be like. So that, that would be my thoughts. I think in, in you know, um, the past many years, I have been helping many of my clients going through this transition. I just actually spoke with my, one of my clients just finished transition this morning. It's a very interesting idea, not only thinking about just like back to what you said. 
I think even when you start a business, many people don't think about exit strategy. So actually, even when you start a business, you're so excited, you always have to think about what the exit plan is. So the earlier you start, the better. But also at the same time, give yourself a three to five years to see who you really want to sell to, uh, what's the outcome you would like to have. And either it's a sell and just leave, or you still want to sell and stay. And afterwards, what kind of emotionally, not just financially, there will be different transition stages there will be. So the more information you have, the more professionals you can talk to. You need a really team of professionals to really uh, um, help you to drive through this, the better prepared you will be after the fact. Because what you think and what's in the end, it can be very different if you don't have enough information. I'm going to skip for a matter of time. Perfect. Hey, can I say something else, Sean? I mean, one of the things, um, it's not just, I think, about um, the sale of the business, but if you're going to use your business to prepare yourself for, you know, a, 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 a lo- to really use your, you know, to use your wealth um, growth potential, use your business to grow your wealth before you think of selling. So one of the things that we find with businesses that we start to work with is that they may, they're throwing off a lot of cash and the owners in particular, especially if they're very small businesses and very closely held businesses, you know, are kind of throw, yeah, throwing off a lot of cash. Think about how you can keep some of that and not pay it all to taxes, especially in California. So many of the businesses that we see don't have good pension plans. You know, they, they think after the fact that maybe they can have a SEP IRA. I, I mean, you can have 401k plans, you can have cash balance plans, you can put away hundreds of thousands of dollars free tax for yourself and your key individuals. And I would think, Sean, that somebody buying your business is going to know that that's free cash flow after they buy, wouldn't you say? Well, you're the expert, but yeah. Well, no, but on the, on the buy side, I mean, somebody's going to say, I'm going to buy this operation. The owners are, the owners are, are investing three, four, five hundred thousand dollars of the cash flow of the business into their pension plan. If they don't have, a, if you're buying a, a company with, with, you know, if you're buying the company, you're not going to buy the pension plan. They're going to give that up. Right? Hmm. Well, maybe that's actually a topic I don't think we've ever covered on it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting the way you put that because it shows how much the the owners have thought about the business. Right. It just wasn't a day to day. It was okay. We get all these processes. We're really thinking about all the steps in the business and that would bleed over into so many other areas of the operations. So that's, that's really interesting. I guess that leads to my question. My next question then for, for each one on the panel, how would you, if someone came to you and said, Hey, I'm thinking of my sell my business in your profession, how would you go about helping them? And this could be that six months, one year, three years in advance. Yeah. So if, it's okay if I start. Yeah. yeah. So I, the first thing I'd probably want to do is find out their motivation. So why do you want to sell? Um, what are you looking for in the sale? What are you hoping to get out of it? A lot of times it's very interesting to ask a business owner, what do they think the valuation of their business is? Because um, sometimes that can be a lot different than reality. And it helps you kind of just understand where they're coming from. Once the emotional side, um, the sale side of what they're looking to do afterward, you kind of get through all that. Then you go to the numbers and what, what do your financial statements look like? How embedded are you in the business? Are you, is the whole business relying on you? If you, you know, when's the last time you've taken a vacation and you can just be completely uh, unwinded from the business? All these types of things kind of give you an idea of, okay, are we in a position where this is a, a, a saleable business or are there some things that we need to do that we might need to fix it and clean it up a little bit so it's more presentable? Anna, when, when should someone get an evaluation done and how would that actually be used in preparing a company for later on what they want to go out to take? Yes. Well, first of all, the importance of evaluation before the deal speaks for itself. It's um, an important part of a due diligence process. It involves the uh, comprehensive analysis as we spoke of financial operations uh, of the target company and its, its potential risks. It's um it's an it's a basis point uh, point for the future negotiation between the buyer and the seller. It helps determine the fair market of the uh, fair market value of the target company, which is important both for the buyer and the seller to make sure that the um, deal and the price is is fair and reasonable. Uh, oftentimes. Uh, 
it's required for the legal and regulatory compliance. Uh, in the situations or in the deals where there is a, sh a shareholder approval is required, um, the qualified uh, appraisal is necessary, is necessary to present to uh, shareholders to ensure that their rights are properly considered. And this is so-called fairness opinions. It's, um, it's the professional evaluation conducted specifically for the purpose uh, to present to the sh uh, shareholders. Um, and it involves the rigorous analysis of the company and also a comparison of the fair market value of the company to its purchase price. So evaluation of folks can uh, help with that. And I'm going to pause here because it's going to take forever to talk how, uh, how big is the valuation and how big of the role of the valuation. However, there's two parts that get into this deal and trying to get uh, whatever reasonable for them. However, the basis might be set by uh, us who are a qualified appraiser. So we are determined the fair market value. Here you go. So then you go and negotiate between each other and set the final purchase price. Sherry, Tyler, Sherry, taxes, Tyler, financials. Um, from tax standpoint of view, I think it's always good to have a different option for explore. Depends on the size of a company. <clears throat> and there may be different options. Also, each personally, when you sell your business, you also have to take a look at what you want to do for your personal financial afterwards. And you get a lot of money and there's a, a lot of tax implication to it. And either you can do a certain, like we take a look at whether charity will be a good option. Or even if you have a small business, 1202, so small stock, op, small stock, uh, you can get exclusive certain capital gain. Or there will be different, like the, um, Jane mentioned earlier, certain type of pension plan. Sometimes when you sell to, to your family members or your son or your kids or even and we can use some what we call modification of a pension plan may not be everything as a capital gain. So there are so many ways you can do different options or even certain type of different trusts. The setup, you can have minimize taxes. But at the end of the day, we also have to take a look at if you do a lot of tax mitigation, there's a lot of limitation, also flexibility with your money too. Um, after the fact, if you decide not to work and you probably need to use your asset to live off on. So those type of things is not just Everything about taxes is also have to look at what your personal finance and what you outcome you want to get, then to, to decide which strategy to take. Sometimes it may take multiple strategies to minimize the taxes, give yourself some um, flexibilities. Tyler, what about the financials? How long does that take to clean up? And when people say clean up, what does that even mean? Yeah, so um, in a perfect world, we'd, we'd hope there was some trending information with several years of good data. Um, if truly the financials are a mess, uh, then then you, you do there is cleanup. That's that's the the where the word cleanup comes. And what does a mess mean? A mess means you know a common one is personal business expenses. Our, our personal expenses are being run through the business. I mean that's one. It, it's correctable, but it needs to be uh, kind of demonstrated. That's not really where the business is at. Um, if there's more severe ones uh, where you might have like income shifting. Uh, which means you're kind of manipulating revenue or um, uh, vendors are being paid inconsistently to manipulate revenue, stuff like that. That's a little bit more extreme and, and uh, might be better off if you're a professional to, to extract yourself from that one. But, uh, but, but generally speaking, uh, just cleanup is, is normal. I mean, you hope that most businesses are doing the day-to-day -day things in terms of reconciling accounts and things like that. But if that's not being done, that would be part of the cleanup. So oh, wait, Tyler, how do you move the numbers around to make the company look better? <laughs> so you know how we said, Peter, we take that outside of this? Ever, I think that might be one. The out there, right? Yeah. <laughs> Jane, from a wealth, wealth advisor point of view, how long in advance should they, should they talk to you? And what questions do you ask them on that first meeting? Um, well, I think it's, we've been talking about some of these things. I mean, a lot depends on, and, and critically, not just what you can do, but what you want, what, what do you want from this thing, right? Um, and a lot of that depends on your age and the vision you have for your life. If you're, we've, we've seen our very young clients um, sell their businesses to some of the big tech firms here. They are nowhere near wanting to stop. 
they just they they're gonna they they want to be serial entrepreneurs. They want to do they want to do the next one. They want to do the next one. That's very different than somebody who is let's say in their fifties and has built a business for twenty or twenty five years and really is looking to get cash flow. So it, it's do you want capital? Do you want cash flow? How do you want to be set up for the rest of your life? How much risk do you want to take for the rest of your rest of your life? Those are all very different outcomes and. I've seen, I've seen clients do a lot of those different things. You know, we've taken a a big chunk of a deal, for example, and just created lifetime income, very stable lifetime income for a client more than anything else. Other, other clients want to walk away with a lot of free, free cash. And some clients want to just walk away with, um, uh, in fact, yeah, cash that they can spend it. Put it this way. Some clients want to walk away with free cash that they can invest so that they have a lot of flexibility in their lives. That's one thing. Um, one of my clients kind of famously took almost all of his free cash. Probably you'll um, uh, kind of get a sense of this and did with his lifestyle what he had wanted to do with his lifestyle. And basically, you know, bought the big house, um, gave himself several years of just cash to live because he wanted to travel the world and do this and do that. And he didn't, he wasn't worrying about more than five years out. And I said, you know, do you want to worry about more than five years out? And he said, no, I'm going to do it again. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to build another business and sell another business or go get a, and, um, I said, okay, uh, you, you know, this is, this is what you're doing for cash. Very different than the client who says, um, I don't know if I'm going to do be able to do it again, or even want to do it again, even though I'm not quote unquote ready to retire, let's take most of that capital and invest it so that even if I don't want to um, sell another, you know, grow another business, sell another business, take that risk, I will be okay at a lifestyle that I'm okay with. Maybe it's not my ideal lifestyle, but it's a lifestyle that I'm okay with. So those are all, I mean, I think one of the things we're all saying here is that there are a lot of things going on in that set of questions. And the sooner you start having those conversations, um, the sooner we can suss out all of the different parts of that, because those are all very different solutions. Speaking of that, I mean, having that one client that's looking five years in the future and then others that are probably looking more Mm long-term or maybe even shorter than that, how would you say, well, you know, again, that valuation, so you know that range the company's worth, having that tax strategy for that exit, having the financials clean, having talking to the wealth advisor of, hey, I need this kind of range for an outcome to live the life I want for this long. How does that prepare the person mentally for that sale? And how important is it mentally? How important is the math, the mental aspect in the transaction? How important is it to prepare in advance that component? You're asking me? I'm asking the panel. It's everything, yeah, right? It's huge. I mean, I'll use my own experience. Um, it's just, you go through this roller coaster ride and the emotions never stop. Even after the transition, new, new things pop up that create emotions. And so it's a big deal. So I think setting expectation with the client of what to expect, uh, what, you know, maybe give them a kind of worst case, best case in terms of what can happen. I think that's a big part of it, advisors, or at least in my role, that I try to temper it, even out the emotions of it and what to expect. I think it's just, it's so huge. I can't understate it. I think that would almost even be the biggest thing. A, a example for me, you know, I, we, we had a $25 million a year business, uh, sold it pretty well. I was a minority owner, but still did pretty well. Originally, I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to retire, I'm, you know, right off into the sunset. Literally before the deal closed, I was already bored, like thinking like, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And so uh, just all these emotions kick in that some you can anticipate, some you can't. But sometimes I think it's how you really will to prepare the client. So I actually go back to Jean's Point is it depends on the client's age too. Like so one of my client recently, uh, we are still in process um, transition. This is a four, four, fourth generation business down to his stepson. And now he's very happy. He just stepped back, but he doesn't think he will retire right away. But because he has been so busy for 40 years and he can't just release. It, originally, he got a really good offer from a big firm, but end up he actually decided to sell within the family just because That's his basically his whole life. And it's not about the money. It's more about who can he really trust and still hold his family business down somewhere. 
operate the way his the fourth generation has done. So and that he got half of the price, but still done for it, and he's happy with it. So go back to the emotion. And another doctor, which I just spoke to this morning, they have been doing this for twenty years. They sold to a venture capitalist, and the emotionally, he's like, oh, it's not mine anymore. And I'm actually getting, but they are going to stay. They're still a minority owner, and then he started getting a paycheck. He never doesn't even understand what paycheck means. It's really funny too because he never got a paycheck his whole life. <laughs> then he's like, "This is so different." My emotionally, even though he got a huge money lump sum up in front in his bank account, he still said, "But monthly, I don't have that much money anymore." <laughs> so it's just、like、emotionally is how to. So every time when they talk to me, they it's kind of like a. I I feel like being a wealth manager is even more like a therapist. <laughs> you have to. Listen to them and how they feel and how to guide them through emotionally. They will be fine in the future. So it's a, it's a very interesting process to see different age, different、um, process to guide them through this type of transitions emotional. And a question for you: Do you ever do an evaluation for someone, hand it to them, and it's not a number that they like? <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat the question? You ever do a valuation and the number you give the person is not a value that they really like? Well, that happens、uh, on a regular basis. <laughs> so there is、uh, a certain, a reasonable range within、uh, within which you、uh, should probably target. So the deviations are possible uh, uh, within the evaluation and performing one,、uh, because the owner of the business know knows their business much better than we. On the other side, that we have like, just a few weeks. Always, we say, "Listen, Anderson, let me say three weeks for performing our analysis after we receive all the information requested." However, how much we,、uh, can we learn and understand about the growth prospects, about、uh, the market of that specific industry that we are valuing that company in,、uh, while the business owner?、Uh, so, of course, if the business owner is not satisfied,、uh, I mean, we go back. And say, okay, what are the points that you are not、um, basically、uh, feel reasonable about? And, and then we speak. However, the basis are always reasonable. There should be a range within which we should land、uh, with both、um, owner and us as a independent appraisals, because our work is going to get then analyzed and scrutinized by auditors, by IRS, and so on. And so forth, which、uh, basically stops the business owner of doing their job and moving forward.、Uh, once our job is not basically、uh, approved, we have just a little bit more time on this panel. Does anyone, without saying you know, clients' names or anything like that, does anyone have a story that they could share with the audience of working with someone to prepare them for that that acquisition? Tyler, you want to go first? Yeah, I would say you know the 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 one that comes to mind is I had someone come to me and they were kind of late in the buying process of of a business, and、um, but it taught me an early lesson early in my career is they they were using their four hundred one k money to actually buy the business, and、um, they hadn't really done a lot of due diligence on the business they were buying. It was a cash based business, and there weren't good financial records. Um, and I got in really at the late point. They had already had an offer and everything. But what what I came away from that、uh, after the deal closed six months later, this lady that this individual that bought the business went out of business. It it, it went bankrupt, and she ended up losing her entire four hundred one k and、uh, had nothing to show for it. So what that really taught me when it comes to this whole acquisition world it, from both sides of it is you really it's back to that planning. It's back to managing emotions. It's back to really hiring qualified professionals,、um, even way before you plan on on、uh, either exiting or buying, because、um, it'll make a world of difference if you do that. I really believe it in my heart. Yeah, I'm.、Uh, I, I'd also kind of like to share a cautionary tale about just the emotional side of side of this, because so many of us just dream of you know what would I do with so and so many million dollars. And what would that be like? And it's there's there's actually a whole study of what people do with sudden money. And not you know we don't have time to go into it today, but super important to think through that. 
Uh, I had one client who was uh, who had built a, a nice small business, probably eight or ten people. She sold it to a larger company, and she had always really just dreamed that her family members. She was a little bit of a black sheep. Her family members were real estate investors, and and she was kind of competing with them. And so she got her, you know, post sale chunk of money. And she decided that she was going to go and be a real estate investor. And she really didn't know about being a real estate investor. And, but she was in this competitive mode. Again, it was very much driven by these, you know, family issues. Everybody knows about family issues. So long story short, she wasted a lot of the money, ended up with, um, made some very ill-advised purchases, bought a big commercial building just before COVID. I could go on. Wasn't, wasn't pretty, ended up with much less long-term capital than she or we would have liked because she hadn't really thought through what makes you happy, what do you want to do with this. There are issues that money can solve and issues that money can't solve. Don't try to, to solve the ones that money can't solve with money. It isn't a good long-term solution. Mm-hmm. Just there's, there's the money stuff we can figure out. Right. The, the finances part of this is pretty straightforward. If you know what you want, the emotional stuff is really on you guys. Talk to people, really understand what's driving you, really understand what's going to make you happy. Because once you get it, you know, it's a lot of your life. It's a lot of your trouble. Um, and you have tremendous opportunities, but you, that's probably the, the single biggest risk is that you, that you don't understand what you really want. So the recent case, just as I was mentioned earlier, the, the two doctors we sold, they sold to the venture capitalists. Actually, it's been going on about a year and a half. So when, when they came to me and they tried to say which, they actually had the three different offers. And we, when I went through the three offers, and then we actually choose not the highest offer on the table because if they choose the highest offer, they have a least control. So what had, I had to walk them through was helping to understand their emotion, what they really want, if, because they're still fairly young. They're in like late 40s and early 50s. So if they just straight out sell, then they just probably leave the business after five years. That may not be what they truly, really want. So that's why after the year and a half of coaching, helping them to figure out and what's their afterlife would be, they still then realize they still want to be in their profession. They still would like to be in part of their business they built over 20 years. So end of the day, we chose the second best offer, but still give them part of the daily management control. And eventually they can participate the upside with the venture capitalists. They may be able to help them expansion in their side of business to open other practices as well. So and that they didn't take the highest offer. That was the end of the day. Mm-hmm. So money is not always, I guess making the most money is not the, always the top option comes to the emotion. Deep down what they really want. All right. We're about out of time. If everyone wants to just go down the panel one more time, if anyone wants to get in contact with you, what's the best way to go about doing that? I'm around Jane at GriffinBlack.com. I'd be happy to talk to anybody who's interested. Just, just talk. No, no pressure. Sure. Uh, website is thinktyler.com. Um, you can get all my information on there. Yeah, my company is pantheonwealthplanning.com, but I also have it registered on the sherrypen.com. That would be easier. <laughs> and for me, I'm a part of, of a big company. So if you want to talk to me, I have a business card, LinkedIn. Um, please feel free. All right. And with that, let's give a round of applause. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, everyone. Thank have you.